So in the first step of this reaction, I have two layers, a layer of hexene and a layer of sulfuric acid, and I'm going to shake them together vigorously with venting to release any buildup of pressure to create a suspension of hexene in sulfuric acid. Okay, so my shaking is done, and here I am remarking that I may have sh shaken it a bit much because it's uh, got air bubbles in it, but the fact that it appears homogeneous means uh, my job is done. Okay, so here I'm showing off my reaction setup. Uh, it's just a reflux column. Uh, this allows you to boil the uh, reaction mixture uh, without losing all the solvent because it gets condensed by the water jacket back into the reaction vessel. Okay, so here I am dispensing my reaction mixture into my round bottom uh, reaction vessel or reaction flask. Uh, did I remember to move the stopper from the uh, separatory funnel? Uh, it looks like I did. Excellent. Okay, so you might be wondering what reaction am I carrying out? Well, it's in the title of the video. It's um, alkene hydration, adding water to a an alkene functional group or a double bond, as you can see here. Uh, two hydrogens, one oxygen, uh, goes and literally adds on to where the alkene functional group was. Um, okay, so this reaction mixture contains concentrated sulfuric acid and hexene. That's all I've added. I can't remember the exact concentration. Uh, maybe I'll go give, give it a check one sec. Uh, okay, it's 85% sulfuric acid and hexene. Um, I did not see what was going to go wrong here, uh, or foresee it, but uh, we're about to find out. <laughs> uh, as soon as this reaction starts, I think I will just do a jump cut. Okay, so here I am lowering the um, reflux column into the uh, round bottom flask, ready to start the reaction. Okay, and here I've got the stir bar spinning. Uh, the stir bar itself is a magnet. Oh, and there's the temperature rising. It's already at 100 degrees. So yeah, uh, it's a hot plate and stirrer. Um, I imagine there's just a coil in the hot plate with an alternating current that makes the magnetic stir bar spin. Okay, and the problem I alluded to has started occurring. Um, the reaction mixture has gone yellow. <laughs> that's not good. Uh, that's very, very not good. And now it's gone dark red. It's just it's just getting worse, and uh, it hasn't even started refluxing yet. I, I'm actually noting that there's no uh, drops coming from the reflux column. Now it's gone black, and I've decided to stop the reaction. But hey, look, the solvent started refluxing because you can see like little um, streaks down the side of the reaction vessel. So I guess technically I got reflux. Um, so. Oh, and here I'm doing infrared spectroscopy on soy sauce. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so the reaction mixture should have resulted in two layers, an aqueous layer and organic layer. As you can see here, it's just, well, organic or aqueous, question mark. Um, the problem is, I didn't add water. Uh, yes, I did need to add water, but uh, before extraction, uh, not during extraction, uh, adding water obviously would have given me two layers when the reaction uh, was finished. It also would have prevented it going this dark colour, which we will discuss shortly. Um, in this clip, I also remark that the water dissolves the dark stuff. I don't think it really dissolves the dark stuff, I think it's just because the dark stuff's more dense and viscous, it just sinks to the bottom. Instead of restarting, I decided to try and salvage what I had. As it turns out, this was not salvageable. Here I was planning to perform an extraction, uh, which I will go into more detail on when I did it successfully. Even after extraction, this is yellow, when it should just be colourless. Obviously there's something very wrong. Okay, so I've added way too much magnesium sulphate, I'm pretty sure. This is uh, very dry now. Nice. Okay, so here I am carrying out solvent extraction under reduced pressure. 
Uh, it definitely gets rid of the dye ethyl ether, and it leaves this thick yellow, I don't know what, paste. <laughs> okay, so here I'm trying to carry out distillation. Um, this purification process works by boiling the thing you want uh, to remove impurities with higher boiling points, uh, and then condensing it. Uh, in this case, I get nothing coming out at the expected boiling point of hexene, which I think is a bit over 100 degrees Celsius. Showing that I probably don't have any hexene. Oh no, wait. Hexanol! My product, sorry. Hexanol. Making tortellini? <laughs> not, not for yourself, sorry. Uh, I've got some pasta. Oi, don't steal my pasta. So I'm back the next morning to this lovely mess of a fume cupboard that I left last night. So, um, yeah, I'm just gonna restart and, uh, do everything all over again, basically. So, I went and did everything again in exactly the same way. Remind me, what is the <laughs> definition of insanity? <laughs> I've burnt it again. It turns out the results I got yesterday are reproducible. Uh, burnt? Um, I think here, I, I was thinking that this was happening due to um, a high temperature. Although, technically, when you get a dark black or dark colour with carbon, it's generally because you oxidised the carbon, uh, which is, but you know, synonymous with burning the carbon. So, technically, burned is correct. So, let's have a look at what's going on here. Um, first, I think it would be useful to look at the uh, reaction mechanism for the intended reaction. So, here our hexene uh, or hexene uh, in the presence of acid, forms a carbocation that quickly reacts to form a sulfate intermediate. This sulfate intermediate is then broken down by water to form our hexanol product. Um, without the presence of water, the concentration of the sulfates and the hexene uh, is increased. And the lack of water also allows for competing side reactions to occur. So, um, with the high concentration and probably quite high temperature, uh, due to the lack of water, we get um, oxidation occurring where hydrogen sulfate or sul sulfate ions um, can be reduced to hydrogen uh, sulfite or even uh, sulfur dioxide. Uh, this, of course, oxidizes our hydrocarbons, increasing the number of double bonds, as you can see uh, in C6H10, there are two double bonds as opposed to the starting one. Um, another process that will occur is oligomerization. Without water breaking down the sulfates, it's highly possible for the alkene to act as a nucleophile and react with um, sulfate intermediates, and this will cause oligomerization, which is basically uh, adding lots of monomers together to form a big clump of uh, monomers. Um, you could kind of call this polymerization, but I don't think it's quite to that extent. So, as you can see, um, it goes to infinity, ad infinitum. It can keep repeating and make bigger and bigger molecules. These large molecules will then also get oxidized by the uh, sulfuric acid, hydrogen sulfate. So if we look here, we can see this process causes a color change. As the molecules get bigger and bigger and more oxidized, the reaction mixture gets darker and moves towards red. So the color change happens because at first smaller molecules with fewer double bonds will absorb higher frequency light in the visible spectrum blue light and if we look at our color wheel the, uh, the complementary color is yellow so we start off with yellow then as the molecules get bigger they will start absorbing uh, across blue and green giving us the complementary color red and finally when we have uh, a big mixture of varying size molecules uh, we will get absorbance across the entire spectrum giving us effectively black tar so, having finally realised uh, what I was doing wrong, I decided to make a third attempt. Let's see how it goes. Right, so we're doing an ion spectroscopy and courgette here. I've got some courgette that's kind of dried out. Right, we've <laughs> done some important science here. And refluxing. Uh, this time it didn't go dark, so success. Hell yeah.
So now that the reaction's finished, I'm dispensing it into a separatory funnel. I'll give it a minute for the layers to separate, and then I will drain off the aqueous layer into the conical flask and label it accordingly. Here is my aqueous layer, I'm going to carry out some extraction on this with the ether. So here I'm draining off my organic layer into a separate conical flask. I've got my first organic layer, I'm going to get, I'm going to do some extraction on the aqueous layer, make sure I get all my product out of it. Basically my, my hexanol product is more soluble in ether than it is in water, so if I add ether to the aqueous layer, I'll get two separate layers and quickly the ether layer will contain most of my product. And I'm going to be printing more ether. So I combined the aqueous layer with um, diethyl ether three times to get as much of my product out of the aqueous layer as possible. Here I'm going to neutralize any remaining acid in my organic layer by adding sodium hydroxide. The ions, sodium and sulfate, uh, will be dissolved into the water and removed uh, into the aqueous uh, waste layer. I'll be testing the pH of the aqueous layer using pH paper. Okay, here I am adding anhydrous magnesium sulfate to my now neutralized organic layer. This will uh, absorb water, any remaining water from the organic layer. So, uh, yeah, this is dry now because when I swirl it, it goes cloudy, but that means that uh, not all of the uh, magnesium sulfate has clumped at the bottom. So that's good to go. Just need to gravity filter this now. So uh, I'm ready to do gravity filtration with my filter paper. I just need to give my funnel a bit of a wash. One performs gravity filtration when they want to remove a solid from a liquid and keep the liquid as pure as possible. Right, there we go, we're doing solvent extraction again. Uh, don't need to heat up the mixture because we're just reducing the pressure and that will uh, evaporate all the diethyl ether. As you can see it's kind of going white, that's actually building up ice on the outside of the round bottom flask because uh, evaporation of ether is an endothermic process, so it, it literally cools down the flask a lot. Dipping it in the water has melted the ice. I'm doing distillation. Here it is. We're heating up this and uh, hopefully it'll, whatever evaporates will condense and go into this collection flask here, which I have pre-weighed the mess of, so I will know the mess of where I'm going down. Here I am adding aluminium foil to insulate the distillation apparatus. Uh, this helps speed up the process because the glassware needs to get hot enough so that my vapors don't condense back into the, um, the the flask that's being heated. Back after lunch, I've cranked the temperature to 200. This better start distilling. Some gas making it to the uh, analog thermometer has finally got above 40 degrees, and as you can see, there's a little like, droplet forming here. Um, I'm not sure. How much is this going to get stuck inside the condenser though before it even goes down the condenser? It's a bit concerning to be honest. We'll see what. Right, so uh, the distillation is basically done now. The product is evaporated, there's nothing left in here. It's still very hot, so that's cool. Um, is my product, hopefully, it's fixable. Uh, and uh, there's still a good few drops left. Like, condenser, so you can like, shake it a bit. 
Right, I am done cleaning up. Got all my washed glassware in that box. Um, and here is my product. Two hexanol. I did not get very much of it compared to the amount of hexane I put in, but oh well, I, I, got, I got something. And uh, from the IR, you can see that there is a hydroxyl peak. So I did get some sort of alcohol in there at least.